so this module this morning is about um, gene expression profiling and more especially RNS seq analysis. And it would be like bringing an overview of quite wide and, and go to up to differential expression. Um, so this is um, <coughs> the career actually, actually I'm just gonna go back to that in a second. Um, a very few words about myself, um, Florence Cavalli. I'm uh, currently a junior PI at the Institut Curie in Paris, and I work, I did my postdoctoral follow uh, in at SickKid with Michael Taylor working on pediatric brain tumors, medulloblastoma especially. And I and joined the Startup to Cancer Canada Dream Team working on glioblastoma and cancer stem cell on a multi omic data set as a bioinformatics project leader before I um, apply and start my lab just a, a year ago. So the lab is still quite young and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, this lecture is about the analytic, and I must give credit to most of the slide uh, to Obi. Um, um, Malakai Griffith, as well as Fouad, um, which uh, ran this uh, module um, previously in the previous workshop. Um, so as I was saying, the, I would actually do that, yeah. Um, the content in this workshop are open, as long as you can share it, reuse it, uh, modify it as long as you acknowledge, so is what I'm doing here. Most of the lecture has been created um, by previous um, instructor and I added a few things uh, more concerned um, uh, from my own experience. Um, yep, uh, so the objectives of the is um, I will bring an introduction to the RNA-seq sequencing, um, talk about the alignment and visualization, and we're going to explore the expression and, uh, and differential expression analysis uh, that you're going to do during the lab uh, later on. Um, so we're going to talk about the rationale of sequencing, what are the challenges. Uh, well, um, you're probably going to have, going through the analysis, analysis you usually uh, are going to ask yourself some questions, and you're gonna, we're going to go through most common questions and talk about technical um, questions related to the analysis. analysis. Um, this is something you're probably very, very well aware of it, just to bring it uh, back to the dogma. Um, the gene and the genome is expressed um, and we uh, there is primary um, transcribed, and uh, we have uh, uh, <coughs> splicing giving a mature mRNA, and this is what we explore in the RNA sequencing, uh, which is going to lead us translated as a protein the active um, elements of the cell. Um, very large overview of the RNA sequencing in a cancer setting. Usually, you have um, different conditions or different samples, tumor type. Um, a, a classical um, experiment would be having tumor sample and a normal sample next to it of the same uh, tissue. So, um, there is a first isolation of the RNA, with, for, for example, um, um, using the poly -A. Then there is a generation of the cDNA. Um, um, cutting the fragments, add linkers to then sequencing. And when we get short read, per hand short read, we align it to the genome, and then we evaluate the expression of the gene that we know of, or we can annotate with some annotation, and there is a downstream analysis. Um, so why are we sequencing RNA as compared to DNA? Um, this is essentially for functional study. And of course, the genome may be constant, but uh, in certain conditions, a different gene can be expressed as you can observe different expression when you have a drug treatment versus untreated for some cell line, or you have a wild type versus not out out in mice, um, as well as you can compare like human tumor as a tumor versus a normal tissue of the same, uh, versus not a normal sample of the same tissue. Um, this RNA-seq, uh, although as well to predict transcript sequence from the genome, uh, which is difficult, um, which is difficult. So the, RNA, the information from the RNA allows to better predict the transcript, with a uh, to better get gene annotation, um, and you can as well ex uh, do some more analysis looking at the alternatives of forms of transcription and the RNA editing. So. Um, of, uh, another way, it's like you, it could help to interpret some mutations that you have identified in your DNA if you have much, um, much um, um, 
whole genome sequencing of, of um, the URNA seq. Uh, it could maybe possibly explain the regulatory function of a mutation in an encoding area that affects the expression of gene in your bind. So that would be uh, the RNA seq uh, analysis that allow you to uh, to have some evidence of getting to that. And you might want to be able to explore if this mutation detected in your whole genome analysis or exome is actually expressed um, or, or not expressed. So there are some challenging links to this generation uh, of the data and the analysis. Uh, first is the quality of the sample with the purity. Um, how to, if we consider tumor samples, um, is all, all your cell and your bulk of samples are they tumor cell or they infiltrating in the non-tumor cells? Um, as well as uh, you know that the RNA consists of small exons uh, which are large introns, so we need to read the map to the genome. Uh, it could be challenging uh, because you have uh, reads that would be split um, um, on exons with an intron in the middle, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about this. Of course, there is a relative abundance of the RNA uh, very widely, uh, which like magnitude, and the uh, RNA sequencing is based on random sampling. Um, so you catch a RNA, like there is a pool of RNA, and you, the more you the deeper you sequence, the more um, fragments you catch. But overall, it's it's a, it's a, it's a random sampling, and there are a predominance of um, in the RNA. There are predominance of ribosome mitochondrial genes. So there are different uh, techniques to uh, like enrich for uh, coding genes, for example, and get rid of those. Um, there are different uh, um, size of RNA, as you need a specific protocol to look at the small RNA uh, to be able uh, to be captured there, to capture there and to be analyzed there, such as microRNA. And um, if you do a poly selection, um, which we do often, it can be a three NBAs. So one of the first things you need to check is the quality of your the RNA in your samples, and one of the measures is the real number RNA integrity. A number that you can get from the bioanalyzer. Uh, maximum, uh, a very good quality uh, sample would have a ring of 10, for which, which is a plot on the right. So, which you can see very only uh, two big peaks of the ribosomal RNA is what you expect because it composes 80% uh, of the RNA in the samples. And a ring of six would be <coughs> a, a plot like this when you have a lot of size uh, for RNA, which is not what you want because that means the RNA is degraded. So um, quite often we recur a ring of seven or both to go and, uh, and generate an seq of a given sample, uh, but we might go lower if it's a very precious sample that you still want to try, knowing that you might spend money and not get very good quality after. So it's a, it's a choice you have to take at the beginning of your experiment, of which sample you're sequencing in function of the quality. There are different ways uh, to enrich for what you want uh, to, for the, to generate the RNA seq. Uh, you can consider the total RNA. In this case, uh, you would have a lot of ribosomal RNA, for example, but that might be interesting for particular analysis. Uh, you could do ribosomal depletion RNA uh, reduction. Uh, what one, one, one is a polyase selection. When you use a polyase cell of the transcript to actually uh, select for them, enrich for them. Um, and then, so each you need to know what type of library uh, you have um, and choose uh, the one you correspond to the question you've been at, you're going to ask with your NSC. Um, this is a bit outdated, I would say, because now you, I would say 99% of the library would be stranded. But in the past, the uh, first kit of Renasic Trancing, um, where you had the option of having a stranded versus non stranded uh, library. And we realized that actually having the information on the strand is, uh, could be very useful, especially when you have two genes that are um, in place on, on, <coughs> on the two different um, strands of the DNA, and that could be both expressed. If you have a read that is in this region that overlap between the two genes on the two strands, you, ca you cannot uh, know if it comes from the gene A on the four strand or gene B on the reverse strands. However, with the stranded uh, DNA, you you able to do that. So the estimation of the expression, the measure of the expression of the gene uh, is a lot more accurate. So we do a strand, um, stranded RNA uh, library now. Um, Excuse replicate me. our work. Yep. Could you please explain a little more what is stranded and unstranded? I didn't understand that. 
Um, it's like in the generation of the RNA, um, in, the, in the process of creating the library, um, you're able um, um, you're able to actually have the information that all the risks come from the same strand versus another strand. And when you align it, this uh, information is um, is taken by a liner, and then you will know where it comes from. You can as well visualize, visualize it later on on JLGB. There is a color code, and then you can look at the, the read coming from the same strand as versus the other strands. And we know that the gene on it did on one strand or the other, and so it's a, you allow you to place your read uh, more accurately. Uh, but honestly, I don't think they would, if you do a new sample now, I don't think they would offer you a non-stranded library. <laughs> That's a, it's a very useful information, which is very common now. Yeah. Um, yes, replicates. Um, so, uh, replicates are always very important in, in our analysis uh, and for the to have a statistical power to actually um, have some significant uh, rich conclusions. Um, however, it's always a choice of how many replicates do you need uh, and how many replicates can you afford in your experiment. Um, if we consider uh, tumor samples, uh, most of the large uh, most of the last study would consider each tumor being a replicate of, of a, a given time, being a replicate on a, of, an, a, of another tumor from another person. So we're not going to necessarily take two pieces of a, tumor, of a tumor of a given person, except if you have a particular question about that tumor laser, but that's uh, something else. Um, so so in, in our differential experiment analysis, if we take tumor uh, versus control, all the tumor would be somehow replicate versus the control being replicated as well. Um, however, if you have experiments with mice, uh, you do want to do repl uh, replicates um, because you can control it better and have more samples coming from mice with or without drug, for example, or with cell line. Uh, if you uh, do experiments with cell line and drug and no drug, you do want several replicates. So when you do have replicates, you want to check that the correlation is, is very good. And if it's not, you have to double shot and figure out one. So there are biological replicate and technical replicate. Um, common analysis code and the analysis um, of the analysis. And the analysis. So we generally look at the gene expression, how much this uh, gene is expressed, and what are the differences expressed between condition A and B, for example. Uh, we can look at alternative expression analysis. Uh, discover new transcripts, uh, particular, particularly expressed in a given uh, tissue or sample. Um, we can uh, study the allele specific expression, which is related to SNP or mutation um, identification, which is not ideal for anastic. We're going to talk a little, bit in, a little bit about that. Um, yes, mutation discovery. Um, we can, there is tools as well to detect fusion from the RNA. Uh, sequencing data as well as RN editing. Uh, when you have your cross, uh, your RNA seq normalized, um, you can as well look for sample plus, do some sample clustering and cluster of samples such which are more similar to each other, such as a group of subtypes of a particular tumor type called sample. And then you can combine with other data sets, also make up clinical data. Um, and that you would uh, talk about that later, later during the week. Um, so roughly, each RNA sequence flow um, has the same uh, pipeline. Um, you, there is uh, you, the library is prepared. You, cho uh, you choose uh, the depths uh, you want, and you obtain the raw data um, from the NGS facility uh, where you've done it. Um, you need to check the quality. Then you need to align the read to your reference genomes. Um, and then process the alignment with different tool to estimate the expression, uh, look for the fusion, for example, and then do differential expression analysis when you have expression. And some of the processing, these are very general using our MATLAB set of scape. Um, and we're gonna see some of the application later on. Um, quite often you wanna create a certain list of some candidates for validation, but there are many different other types of analysis you can do in function of your question. Um, there is one, uh, there are some common questions when you start the analyzing your, so actually I'm gonna ask, um, I don't know if you can all raise your hand or not. How many of you have already analyzed the NASIC data? 
maybe you can, I can't see with the hand or no hands. <laughs> Let's try. <laughs> I can see one, two. I guess there is a yes option. Three. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's continue. Thank you for raising your hand. Um. So maybe you, for the one who you already uh, analyze and an analytic data set, maybe you ask uh, yourself, uh, what do I do with the um, duplicates? Should I remove them or not? Um, this is a different uh, question and different um, setting as uh, in uh, DNA or in the whole genome or exome sequencing, because um, the, the, where the start of the read actually uh, define uh, by the start of this transcript. So this, there is no a random um, and a random distribution of all the reads because they all come from a particular transcript. And so the start is defined by the transcript trial the transcript trial site. So for um, so, um, so in general we don't remove them. Um, but if you do want, because of X and Y reason, uh, pay attention to assess them at the pair level and not at the single uh, read level. So we don't want to guess the distribution by remote then, because it's really it's kind of unlikely to that there are two um, PCR duplicate due to the amplification. How many, how much library depth is needed for the um, RNSX? This really depends of your question and what type of analysis you want to do. Um, if you want to do, I would say, just a basic gene expression analysis and find the most differently expressed genes, you don't need to go very deep. If you do want to look for alternative transcripts that are expressed, or even mutation coding or RNA editing, you do need to go deeper um, in, in, your, um, in your sequencing to have more reads to, uh, to support uh, the identification of an alternative transcript or a differential expression of an alternative transcript, for example. So it's dependent as well as, as um, of your read lens and if they are pair and pair, now we pretty much do always pair. And how much uh, computational approach uh, you can, resources you can have, but I hope you, most of you have access to a cluster to do analysis. Um, one way to start when you have, I would say no idea of how much read you will need for your library is to identify publication, which have done similar things that you want to do, what are your goals? Uh, you can for sure talk to your NGS platform. They are quite used to that and they would very likely recommend um, what is the standard that we use, um, how standard library size we use uh, for a particular uh, analysis of RNA-seq. Uh, you can perform a pilot assessment, uh, like spending a bit more money to actually sequence small read and then evaluate how much information you gain by downsampling your read comparing to what you, the answer you want to uh, uh, you want to get, uh, but a rough, um, just an idea. It's um, we often say that hundred million pairs. It's a good, um, it's a good uh, depth, so it's a good size uh, to uh, look at alternative testing analysis from analytic data. Just like to give a ballpark of where to start. You can go more or less in function of your question and the budget you can um, you can um, afford on the analytic uh, data generation. Uh, what mapping strategy should you use for RNA-seq? Um, if you do have short reach, which is uh, less and less common now, um, you can align it to the genome plus the genome, such as the Bolivar, um, or you can do an assembly, such as Transabis. But most of the time, you read are longer than spicy bear press reads, and you want to use a splice and no, spice aware aligner, such as Wotai, which is one of the first one, Topat, and now we usually make use Star and hit site. It's at, which is what we're going to talk about um, in this lecture. Um, what if you don't have a reference genus? This is unlikely um, and for people that work in cancer, because uh, usually we have data coming from human tumor or maybe mouse models. Uh, but um, but just for you to know if there is no reference genome, maybe the possibility to actually second the genome uh, or, do a, or do a de novo assembly of the transcriptome, but that's outside of this lecture for, them, for sure. So um, is there any question about this general introduction about rna -seq? Yeah. 
Florence, maybe you could just uh, uh, talk briefly about the computational requirements for um, RNA sequencing alignment, because sometimes it can be pretty large, especially for index generation. So what sort of resource should the students be looking for? Um, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about that when we actually talk about the alignment, how it's worked and which one we use. Um, oh, and great. Then at the end, um, yeah. Right, thank you. Um, but thanks. Uh, yes, um, yeah, uh, Yes. Uh, I, um, so I have a question about the uh, removing the duplicates. Uh, so you said it's not good to remove the loop duplicates in a RNA seq experiment, right? We tend to keep them because they are can be useful information, uh, and it's less likely to be a true PCR duplicate. Uh, um, so, how do you yeah. distinguish whether it's a PCR duplicate or not a PCR duplicate? I mean, do you need to first do removal of the duplicates and then do another expert, I mean, another analysis without the duplicates and see whether if there's a change or something like that? You, you can. Um, you can do that once to convince yourself that you should keep them or not keep them. <laughs> but uh, like at the start of the transcript of the gene, so you're gonna have plenty of reads that would start at the same place. And it's just because it's an enrichment of genes that is really expressed and you have an enrichment of these reads there. Um, so you don't wanna remove all this, uh, this um, reads that could be PCR duplicate, but are more likely to be uh, uh, several um, um, coming from several transcripts from the same gene. We're actually going to, I will show you a plot how you can plot something to give you an idea if you have a lot of lot of duplicates, and this might be a, a, um, a, a worry or a concern in your data set. All right, thank you. I'll, can I just add a little bit to? to this discussion. Yeah. Um, the other consideration with PCR duplicates, or so, so which is a um, true consideration for mutation calling, like we discussed in previous modules, for RNA-seq, you're not usually doing mutation calling. You wanna quantify your gene expression. So you don't wanna remove part of your actual genes expression. And especially for small genes, they can you can only break that RNA in certain ways. So you're gonna see the same breakage over and over again, especially for small genes. So you don't wanna bias your, by removing duplicates, you're biasing this, this error of removing the wrong thing in small genes and genes that have a really high expression value where you're likely to get the same breakage over and over again. So to, um, to know if your library is good or not, I think you know looking at library complexity is the best thing to do, but the nobody really removes duplicates anymore for RNA seq data. Okay, so that's my addition. All right, thank you. Um, so, in the second part, we can, we're going to talk about the RNA seq alignment changes and some common questions. Uh, what are the strategy? What kind of aligner you could use? Um, the output of the aligner, which has the BAM uh, file and some uh, BED file. I believe you already gone through the, um, looking at BAM files. Um, how do you probably visualize the, the alignment with IGB? Um, and then some, we're gonna show a set of QC uh, assessments you can do after alignment to check if this everything is uh, all right to continue the analysis. Um, yeah, you can have uh, from our analytic data, now you can have a lot, a lot of reads, millions of reads, and this have to, um, to be a place on the genome, considering that uh, they're likely to be um, um, to be from exons and they are in between. So you want to splice your alignment. Um, you can, um, if you've never done that, and never, I would say, um, um, uh, you, you can run the first aligner once, but you're probably gonna have to play uh, with, uh, with the parameter and um, estimate uh, the quality of your alignment and do it a few times uh, before you're happy with that. Yes, Emma. Hi, sorry, there's a question on Slack that I thought might be useful to everybody. Um, what do you mean by library complexity? No, that's for Sarana. <laughs> Hi, 
hang on while I click buttons and become visible again. So library complexity is has to do with um, how much input material you had. So if you're if you didn't actually get too much RNA out of your tissue and you make a library of it, you're going to you know, those thousand transcripts that you isolated from your tissue, you're going to make a big library that just represents that low complexity sample. Whereas if you get a really good sample from your tissue, you're going to see 25,000 genes, right? And all their isoforms, et cetera. And so the deeper you sequence, the more unique things you find. So when you look at, um, you know, by increase the, increasing the number of reads, how many genes are you identifying? that line should go up and then eventually it's gonna tail off because you've found everything and you're just gonna find more transcripts of those same genes. But if your library complexity is low because you didn't start with too much, you're gonna sequence a bit, find those thousand things, add more sequence and not find anything new. So you've plateaued. And so you can look at, so looking at library complexity is one of the um, kind of QC steps that you'd wanna do with your RNA-seq data. And if your library complexity is low and you're finding the same things, you're gonna have all these duplicates which are real PCR duplicates because you didn't have anything much to amplify to begin with. So ho hopefully that makes sense. They're gonna be a plot which is close to what you're saying just after in the case. Yeah. Um, so there are different uh, mapper um, uh, with splice over and um, align uh, to, uh, that you can use to align your analytic to the genomes. Um, one of the common um, uh, ones that people use is ASAT2, um, uh, but for example, on Biostar, as you probably know this website, that people ask questions and you can see a conversation about which one should you use, what are, what are the advantages of, um, et cetera, a comparison between the different aligners. Um, so with the RNA, there are three um, strategies. Uh, you could do de novo assembly. Um, if you don't have reference, um, you can align to a transcript, but uh, the transcript, I'm sorry, um, but only if your read are really short. But more generally, we align, we align to reference uh, genomes with a splice of alignment. And this is what this slide said. Um, it's more on more of the case you will um, align to reference genomes. Um, and of course, the other strategy, de novo, and align to transcriptome needs another alignment tool, an assembly tool, which I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, this is a plot that I find really interesting, um, but I didn't find a new version of it. It's, it was published probably in 2018. It was a different tool that came along um, being published and people using them and adding them uh, progressively. So one of the very uh, common um, aligner was Top Hats that uh, a very large community used. Uh, in what well, so it came out in 2009, I believe. Um, and um, But it actually require a lot of memory and it takes a lot of time. So for a uh, 100 million read uh, library, you would, need, uh, you would need a day to run it um, and you couldn't run it locally. So it was uh, like high, a lot of uh, high memory usage and high, uh, high time usage, if I can say that. So after this um, aligner that um, was very useful at the time and the best at the time. Um, the new um, aligner will have several aims. It was to um, have a better uh, mapping um, accuracy of the read, which what you want at the end. You want the read to be to have the, <laughs> the best place on your genome and to be sure that it comes from this particular place. Um, you want to not use too much memory, so reduce the memory you did and reduce the time you need to, um, to have your tool run to actually uh, align uh, and uh, like uh, some um, and as examples. So after uh, Topat, uh, a few years later, um, you had Topat 2, and then you had Star, which uh, went um, uh, a lot faster. Um, so from one day, it went down to about uh, 20 minutes to run your sample, line all your sample of 100 million reads. However, you still needed to, you still need 28 gig of memory because the you need to store the reference genome and it's a very large, uh, it's a large reference genome. So it's a user, a new way, use uh, an indexes. So the search is done differently because you have the index and that's how the time is reduced, but the memory usage was still quite large. And so HITSAC um, actually solve, oh, I don't know if I can solve, but improve both uh, the memory usage and the time. And so HITSAC can allow you to 
you need about four gig um, to get the different indexes, and you can run it uh, on your laptop uh, for on a local machine. And, uh, you need, and it's about the same time as Star, uh, so you will need about 20 minutes to, um, to align 100 million with uh, um, an ASIC sample. Um, so here we'll mention, uh, talk about HITSAC and um, HITSAC2, um, HITSAC, how it works and how uh, very briefly how it works and uh, what's how make it like quite fast and efficient uh what they did for that um so of course you have the problem of you have an six that map they can read that can spam large entrance so you need to figure out which part of the read of a single read um match to a particular entrance like skip uh, exam skip the entrance and then uh, match to the exam so how do you find that um Initially, I stop at uh, another learner we're doing. You would take your read and you would try all the genome, <laughs> and it would take a very long time. So now, um, it's like they use two reference. Um, so it's a placebo and and it, um, it's uh, he used two indexes um, to do a search in two steps. There is a general first a global search, um, then you look for a match. Of, a, um, of the beginning of the read up to 28 base pairs. And when you find a very good match uh, of this beginning of the read, then you do a local chest with a different indexes that allow you to do that in two step and so reduce responsibility as an amount of time you need to find um, the perfect match. Um, this is what, uh, so yeah, there is a, um, like 48,000 local indexes that uh, you use in the second step um, to uh, to finalize your map your mapping, um, and I will go through two example three example. So in the case of A, it's a read that actually fully uh, maps within an exon, which is a more simple case. So you first uh, the idea is that you first align um, the read uh, with a global index, which is a I would say a rather slow part. And when at least twenty eight space pairs is actually um, map in one location, which leads to the uh, to the extension mode, um, um, which is like you can see in this arrow, it's a purple. And then if you continue mapping this read uh, perfectly up to the end of the read, um, you have a good match and uh, that's the end of the church. That's the most uh, first simple case. Um, up. The uh, uh, scenario B is you have a read that uh, map, uh, mainly to uh, one exons, and then you need to skip an entrance and then map uh, again um, to the uh, to the other part of the of an, uh, to another exons. So in this case, you do the first global search uh, until you have an exact match of 28 base pairs. Then you extend as before uh, your mapping. Um, in this case, up to for example 93 base pairs. And this, uh, you, if it doesn't match anymore, then you switch to a local search to be able to map um, uh, the, the remaining base pairs. And on the third scenario, uh, number uh, that uh, little example C here, then you have like half of the reads that map to one exon and half of the reads map to the other exon. So you start with a, a global search to find the, the benchmark at the beginning of the 20 base pairs. Then you extend. Um, when it doesn't map anymore, you would use a local search in this area to find a new map and then extend again. So it's how they kind of solve the memory slash, uh, um, slash time uh, for some uh, time usage uh, problem of the line. Um, I do actually have a question for you. Um, have the ones that uh, did already some analysis analysis, have you used this uh, aligner or have you, used another, have you used another one? People can just talk. No? Uh, we are using a star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We're very common as well. If you do have a group, if you do have a, a cluster for sure, um, and it's part of most of many pipeline stars as well. I, I used that as well. Um, yeah, let's continue. Um, so should I allow multi-map reads? Um, it depends, again, it depends on your application and what you want, which kind of analysis you want to do. Um, if you, if you want to look at uh, um, X 
expression analysis with 500 config and two type um, string types, uh, you should allow this multi-map um, as well if you want to look at fusions because um, that might help you to actually identify fusion because if you only like in the DNA search, sometimes when you have multi maps you just randomly assign to a particular place that that might not be the right one. And uh, with other evidence uh, in other places, uh, you could detect a fusion, for example, if it was not. So you want to keep the option of having the read aligned to the best place they can, um, so that you, you keep often the multi-map route. But it's a question you need to ask yourself in function of what you want to do. Um, um, the output of the aligner as a SAM or a BAM file, um, so the SAM for sequence element, uh, map and the format and the BAM is the binary of the SAM which takes less space. Um, I believe you have looked at uh, the SAM and the BAM file already um, in the previous days. Um, so I don't need to explain that. You have information to your alignment at the top. Uh, you would, for example, find the command you use if you um, if you don't have this information or if you get a BAM um, from, um, from another um, um, and I think data that you download, um, if, the, if the method is not really well described in the paper, for example, you can look at the, <coughs> at the BAM and look for exactly the parameters they use to align it. Um, you guys as well have some information in the header of what are the different um, like, uh, uh, keys like, um, yeah, it describes. And then um, in the, you have information about the alignment. Of course, you have the uh, read names where you map for how long was it a perfect match or not, the, the read uh, sequence and the quality and some a lot more other information. And then more you process your, your uh, BAM file, you can actually add other information of, uh, on the slide. Um, so working with the BAM is very common and you want quite often to access it directly to a particular location or to look at a particular zone of a gene. And for this, you can use bed file to specify where you want to go or where, which uh, type of read you want to retrieve for a particular location. This is very useful if you do have your big BAM and then you want to look at a particular place in the genome, for your favorite gene on IG, you can create mini BAMs which you can a lot more easily download locally and look at your RGB and not wait a long time that you're being bang loading your, on your RGB uh, locally. So you just specify with a bed format um, the chromosome names, the start position and the end position of your region of interest or your exome or your gene. And then you can um, subsample the band of the read of interest that map in this region and load this on, on the RGB, for example. Yes, yeah, so is there a question? Yeah. Um, there are tools to manipulate BAM and cell, some tools and to pick up, um, and some tools that will to manipulate bed file, which is a bed tool of bed top. So that you, you're going to use uh, some tool, for example, in the lab. And you probably use it before. Um, how are they sorted? Um, generally, they are sorted by position uh, because uh, actually, it depends on the tool you're going to use after to, um, to query your BAM file. Some tools require that they are sorted by position, most of them, but some wants to be, them to be sorted by read name, because so you have the pairs that are next to each other um, for particular um, um, analysis after. So uh, you might need to resort your BAM in function of the software you will, uh, you, that will be used um, to uh, clicking the output of the, the BAM file. But there's a tool command web, and with some tools, you can uh, easily sort on one uh, by position of a read name. And this is a common MR set, so you, your tool doesn't run because actually your BAM is not sorted the uh, way they needed it to be. So just keep in mind that could be an issue. Um, so, IGV, uh, you certainly opened it yesterday when you look at the uh, mutations, so you can actually load a BAM file from a uh, trans, um, an ASIC alignment. Um, a result of an element of the analytic uh, on IGV, and you can look at the, the read, and actually you can you can see here some read can be uh, spliced um, to the um, read, like you have a read uh, mapping on the exons, and then the end of the read are mapping on the other exons. So, and you can specify one of the IGV options is to specify this trend as well. Um, 
Um, there are other alternatives you wrote to HGV. Um, you might have your favorites. Uh, one of the one common use is Savant, and there are other ones that there's, that's, that's, I would say, a matter of taste. <laughs> but uh, HGV is a very common and useful one. Um, we're going to talk about a few ways to assess the uh, quality um, of, the, of the alignment. Uh, with several plots you can perform um, thanks to um, RCQC, RCQC uh, which you have a link at the bottom. Um, there are other, other tools as well, but this is a very uh, useful and common one. So one of them is to look at the element you see and looking at the three prime or the five prime, uh, prime based. So basically for every single transcript, um, all the reads are been into 100 values, and then you look at the coverage across these 100 uh, bins for every single transcript. Um, and then you can check if you read out on like properly map all along the your transcript between the five prime and the two prime, or if you have a clear place, such as you can see in the second distribution here with a lot more read mapping on the three prime map. Um, this is something you wanna be aware of. Um, in this particular case, it's likely that you actually have two uh, library um, that have been prepared differently, and you do want to consider all the sample cases because um, this um, this distribution can be as uh, your analysis later on. And if you don't pay attention to that and uh, find some cluster the, at the end uh, between a different sample, you might come from this at the beginning. So um, it's unlikely that you have data with different library, if not that's a person that generated the data should tell you. <laughs> but if you download data from a public data set, uh, you should check that they all have, uh, I would say, a good QC. And in this case, for example, if like the sample of one type or the other type, uh, or at least uh, consider them uh, separately, or um, you could maybe put them together with uh, some batch effect um, to take the batch effect and score it for it. Um, the three prime end, um, it's often because um, you have no more degradation of the RNA at the five prime, so it's, it could be quite common. Um, but um, yeah, you, the thing is that you don't want to make this too dark. Um, at the beginning of the read, uh, so the primer should be random. <laughs> um, so they should, you should be, have as much as the A, C, G, O, T uh, um, reads. Uh, um, proportions uh, and uh, all along the reads, but when you actually plot uh, the frequency of the ACGT um, or function of the read position, you will often see that the first 10 base pairs, um, um, this is not uh, as flat as the 25% as you expected. Um, you, we usually actually trim those um, because it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, it's a, the real information and this and this can mess up a bit your mapping. So um, you can try to um, to keep it on the line and do some QC and then do the same uh, by trimming the first and base pairs on the lag again and see if the the mapping uh, improve. Um, you would very likely uh, trim your beginning of your read. Yeah. Uh, we have another question in the. Uh, on the Slack, uh, Mabina has asked, what is, it, what is exactly the three prime and five prime bias? Could you explain it biologically? Mm -hmm. um, so there is a natural tendency of your RNA to be degraded, and this is more degraded at the five prime end. So uh, you're less likely to have reads that come from the five prime end than the three prime end. Um, so that's actually, um, and when you do poly selection, you have a, a, a bias so, to other supreme opposite. There's another hand. Yeah, uh, um, I have a question. So, uh, is it is it yeah. removing the primer and uh, adapter is two different things, or is it the same thing? Because you can remove adapters using that if you use the trimomatic. So, uh, uh, is it diff so the trimomatic adapter? If you remove the adapters from the trimomatic, it only removes the adapters but not the primer section, right? Mm, yeah, it's not too long that I use this particular tool, so I cannot 100% tell you yes or oh, no. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, my, yeah, okay. So, uh, is, is removing primer 
and removing adapter is two different things? Yeah, you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sorana. Uh, you do want to re remove adapter and then you go to the primers and usually you remove as well. Would you agree? Um, so the adapters are the extra sequences you're adding so that your cDNA sticks to the flow cell, right? The primer is going, it's random because unusually it's like nine base pairs longer or something. And it, yeah, it is because you can see it there on the plot. It is a random primer. And the ones that are complementary to your RNA is what will bind to your RNA. So they have the adapter on one end, the primer, and then they, they bind perfectly and they extend when you make your cDNA. So it actually matches your RNA molecule. So you don't want to remove the primer because that was already like a sequence that was in your RNA molecule. And then you extended it, right? You made your cDNA, which now has adapters. So you can sequence from the adapters in. Um, the reason you see this pattern is because um, I guess, I guess the random, random primers aren't <laughs> random. Um, and you always see some like um, uh, skew in the, in the distributions, which are in the random primers are not the same distribution that you're going to see in the human genome, right? Okay. So, so that's okay. Um, it's just that then your, your, your cycles in the sequencing read will be skewed away from the, the, the rest of the reads, right? Which are not the primer, um, or sorry, from the rest of the mRNA, which isn't what start. You're just starting off with the primer. So you don't want to remove the primer. You just want to remove the adapters. The primers should match what your RNA bases were. They'll, they'll be complementary. Okay. Even though you see this uh, spike, uh, um... yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another another thing to check is the quality of um, a few base calling. Um, so the the way we do it is using the FRED's quality score, which is made with 10 log 10 of the probabilities that the base is calling wrong. And so if you consider a score, a FRED score of 30, it means that there is one out of a thousand chance that the base calling is wrong. So you do want uh, a, a FRED score above um, 30, for example. Uh, on the plot on the right, it's actually a good plot because all the and along the position of the read between the five hands and the pants, you have the quality, uh, the FRED score quality being quite high and above, uh, even above 50 all, all the time. So this is a good quality sequence. Um, this go back to the question of the PCR duplicates. So one plot you can uh, produce, which is the one on the right, to have an idea of uh, if that could be a problem in your in your library or something went wrong when uh, like clearly wrong when you you want to unusually it. Um, so that's, uh, you actually compute the occurrence of the read and the number of, uh, uh, the number of it. So how often um, this read is, um, is mapped to the same position. Yeah. At the, the, the way it's a number of read and lock 10. So um, it's okay to have a few uh, that are like this, but it should go down. Um, most of the read have a, um, uh, not duplicate. Um, so this is um, another plot that's uh, generated by this tool that can be informative of how much you need to sequence the sequencing depths. Um, and basically, you can consider all um, all you read and take a percentage of it and evaluate how many uh, known junction of novel junction you get when you only use 10%, 15%, uh, 20%, 30%, et cetera, et cetera, up to 100% of your library. Do you get information or not? Um, so here we can see that known junction kind of flat to uh, at some point and stay, uh, stay flat the curve. So that means like you get using more and more read, you don't get more information. Um, this is linked to the plot Serena was mentioning. You can look at when you doubt something you read, how many genes you find as being expressed uh, with 10, 20, 30, 40% uh, 
um, of your rate. Um, if it's become flat at 50% of your rate, you actually spend half of your money for, your, for this, um, for this uh, library sequencing in like resequencing the same type. Um, so you don't gain more information with more rate. Um, so that's one way to estimate uh, if you do pilot experiments, for, for example, um, if you do need to sequence more or less for the next samples. Um, you can as well check the proportion of the, of the base distribution, where does they map? Uh, if you have a poly uh, library, you want that most of them actually uh, map to coding uh, region. If it's a world transcriptome library, this proportion could be a bit smaller, and you will have some antronic, um, um, you have some reads that map to the antronic region. So you need to know that in function of your, the way you generated your library, this is going to be different. What about NCR size? So you, you and I are fragmented in a particular with a, like a target uh, lens, uh, but this lens has a distribution. For example, um, you want, uh, when you prepare it, you want to fragment about 300 base pairs, and then you would have reads from both sides doing 100 and 100 base pairs. So you have a gap in the, in the middle that would be 100 base pairs if your total was 300. One thing that you don't want is that your you fragments are shorter too short, and then uh, if your read are long, they actually become overlapping. Um, that's not, not something you want because you will actually sequence twice the same thing uh, with your two reads of your parents, and you might overestimate. If you look at mutation, you they might uh, like give, give you bias that you don't want to have. So most commonly now you have parents of 100 base pairs, 150 base pairs. So you do want at least 300. 100 or 500 uh, fragments, um, um, fragments to be able to second the parents and still have the, the gap as a, um, in a mid in the middle and not have overlapping reads from the same uh, fragment. This was clear. Um, here um, is that you can actually uh, load your your BAM uh, in your IGV and, and zoom, zoom, zoom to look at a particular position and probably have an estimation of the variant LL frequency. Um, but be careful of this type of analysis with the LSEC. You never know if this is, if it's um, LDS by the fact that um, um, the LL are both expressed or not, are they expressed equally or not, um, as well as if it's somatic or not somatic. Um, this is not something you can define well from the analytic data. So there is um, um, a tool which is Aprotect Polar from uh, GATK to call mutation from analytic, uh, but uh, be aware that there are a lot of peers um, you, you, it's not as good as calling mutation from a, a world genome library or an exome library. Um, I would very uh, recommend to use uh, MultiQC, which is actually a tool that gather all the output of the different um, 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 QC tools you might have run on your FastQ or on your BAM, et cetera. Uh, he actually supports 102 tools, I checked off last week, um, and that pull everything together uh, very nicely, usually, and the, it's a lot easier to go through. For example, you might have run FastQ, um, FastQC, and you get a, a file for every single sample when you have uh, 100, 200 or 300 samples of these level ash parts, you cannot go through. Uh, but this tool would allow you to actually flag the sample a lot more simply and have an overview of the older QC and you get the output of most of the tool like, together, together. And it's, it works with uh, an ASIC tool, but it works with the tool and other, like, um, other tools that work from other uh, omic data. Um, then we're going to talk about um, the uh, evaluating the expression of the gene and differential expression. Um, is there a question? Okay. One. I have one question for for us. Yeah. So when you're looking at sequencing depth, then you should just always construct those uh, rarefaction curves to make sure that they plateau. That's how you know you reached enough sequencing depth, right? Again, it depends of uh, 
that's one way to check that you're sequenced enough. But this plot, this plot was to look at how, how many junction, new junction you would get from what you, what you already know, like for the, with the reference you have for the, for the different transcript. Um, um, so if it's plateau that tell you you're not getting more information, so that's uh, good information, but you might want to do that with how many genes do I detect they being expressed if I get more and more reads as well. You need to plateau as well. Um, so there are several metrics you can, you can look like this, yeah. I see, okay, thank you. So Anna, would you like to add something about this? If you have a good way to estimate how deep you need to go. <laughs> um. I mean, you can't, so it depends on your experimental design. If you're going to compare two conditions, you kind of want to have sequence sort of the same depth across both, right? That's right. Um, so it, it depends on your experimental design, but um, this plot is really, it's really useful, like Laurent said. Right, but if you're looking at a sort of a cancer sample versus a, a, a non-cancer sample, so a healthy, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to sort of get straight in my head how would that look for a cancer sample where one or two genes would just dominate whereas in a, a healthy sample you wouldn't have that what do you mean that one or two genes would dominate well i'm, I'm assuming if if it's or a few genes i don't know how many genes would be responsible or would be mutated when you're looking at a cancer sample but it would certainly be a subset of all the genes that are possible and um, so those would tend would, to dominate, we, right? We would look for what, which of the genes are overexpressed or downregulated, upregulated, or downregulated as compared right, right. to the normal. Right, right. or um, downregulated. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and it would be a set of genes, but you still want to know that if you get more and more reads, do you detect the expression of more genes or not? That's one of the information, okay. and both in the normal as well as in the tumor. But it, like you should uh, aim to sequence uh, the same number of reads uh, in in both of your samples from the beginning already. You don't want to sequence okay. less of your normal because it might be it might I don't know maybe less complicated complex. Uh, but that's one of the things uh, Serena mentioned. But uh, like I would advise to start with the same amount of reads when you start your pilot experiment for both. Yes, Serena. I was just gonna okay. say it's an interesting comment that. Um, that you, you might expect that your normal tissue is less complex. I don't know that that would be the case. Yeah. It really no, depends. So, so cancer grew from one cell, right? It's a clonal expansion. Your normal tissue is a chunk of tissue, which has tons of different kinds of cells, usually not that one cell that the cancer grew from. So usually the, the normal sample is pretty complex in terms of the cell types represented within that tissue, unless you're doing something like um, I don't know, pancreatic islet cells. And then you're just going to se sequence insulin over and over, <laughs> right? But if you sequence deeply enough, you'll start to see other, other, um, other genes as well. But in most tissues, your normal sample, like if you're doing brain cancer and you take a chunk of brain, there's going to be dozens of cell types and you know millions of cells there. So you'll have a really diverse population that's represented in your sequencing data. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, there is another hand raised. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I have a question about the sample preparation. Although um, at the initial stages, let's say you have a few biological replicates, but when you get the samples, uh, uh, you don't have enough uh, some enough uh, sample to uh, do the sequencing. So, so in that case, if you combine them all the biological replicates together and uh, then sequence it. Uh, is it is it a better way to do that or is it advisable or because you don't have enough sample to do each biological replicate but do you mean enough material at the beginning like you haven't extracted yeah, I mean, enough RNA yeah, I mean, is it uh, if if you pull them together, if it's let's say it's a like one condition, but you have different mouse samples, and if you get everything together into a one sample, 
as a one sample and pull them together and sequence it is it a good way to do that or is it not a good way to do the sequence mm -hmm. I would still keep the affirmation of the different uh, library from the different sample at the beginning. And then in your analysis, you might merge them or not, but you want to check that uh, there is no bills that have been introduced along the way. Okay. So you need to make sure you have a way of differentiating each biological replicate, right? I think if you want to do yeah. differential expression analysis, yes. Yeah. yeah. You need For sure. Replicates. You need okay. replicates. If, 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 you, do, you, uh, if you don't have enough tissue because you're you're working with a really rare cell type or something, then um, there are some library prep kits that take in you know very small amounts of um, of material of starting material. But if if it's still not suitable, uh, then you'd want to consider single cell sequencing or a different kind of library prep um, and data generation, right? If you don't have it, or you could pool like the super rare cell type from a bunch of mice and make one pool. And then you make another pool and another pool. You need about three replicates to get a good differential expression analysis. Okay. You, you don't want to do one, one versus one. Yeah. So you need at the end to have a distribution to be the tr at least three versus three when we do the differential expression analysis. Okay. Okay. All right. We, we're gonna, yeah. You, you're going to do in the lab a different expression analysis. You. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me, I have another question. About the thing that you said that normal cells, normal uh, samples are also, are also very, very complex and we can have different cell types in a normal sample. Where do we need, uh, where do we use this uh, extra information? As far as I know, we just compare the tumor cells to normal cells. So if these uh, normal cells are coming from different cell types, where do we use this information? You need single cell information to do it, but to deconvolve it, that's, it's a new way we're starting to think about of the anastic analysis, I would say, that we didn't in the past, we just, we're just considering bulk, um, like as you have it, the bulk here anastic data. Um, knowing that um, actually it's like one of the images is it's a, a mix, um, um, it's a smoothie, <laughs> like you have all your fruits blend together. <laughs> um, so that's a single cell area and the analysis we were able to do with the single cell data that allow us to, um, to really um, show that there were all this cell type uh, and this kind of information. Um, so you would need also data set to be able to take that in, into account, I believe. In the analytic data, usually we just compare one condition versus another or a normal versus a tumor or something like this as a bulk. Yeah, yeah. that's Thank you. And on the bulk, you might have, you know, your normal sample and then like two kinds of tumor and you just compare them to the same reference and find the things that are different from the normal and then different in A versus B, right? So you have to think about what your normal is and what your experimental setup is, and, and that will help you interpret your results. And I just don't remember from the previous session about single cell, it, it was, can we understand which part of the normal cell is now this part of the tumor cell? Can we understand that? Um, just, I think, this afternoon, <clears throat> we're going to have the session on single cell RNA-seq. So that will build on this module. Okay. So yesterday was DNA, like DNA sequencing, which mm -hmm. doesn't get to anything to do with expression, but you'll discuss expression differences um, between Good. single cells. After, after uh, Florence teaches you about expression differences between bulk samples. Okay, thank you. But your question is, is, is very like, Revelant, and that's one of the main questions we're asking with single cell data. Um, that you, you, we are not able, to, we were not able to answer with uh, bulk before. Yeah. Oh, Professor, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm working with TCGA, and it has two types of normal 
um, samples. So one is one is blood normal and the other one is solid normal. Which one would you recommend? Uh, let's say if, if you're doing lung cancer. Uh, for the analytic analysis, I would take the normal lung sample that they have. And what because about... you don't want to you don't want to compare the transcriptome of your blood versus the transcriptome of lung. Right, and right. It yeah. would be different because of the tissue type. Um, right. The blood normal is very useful from with uh, from liquid, but uh, from uh, to uh, to get uh, your reference um, um, a genome for this particular uh, patient and do a somatic mutation. So that's why we take blood and we do uh, exome or genome on it to be able to know if this mutation is already present everywhere, such as in the blood, or if it's somatic on a new tumor. So if for, so for um, somatic variant, you would recommend blood, but for differential expression, you would recommend the nearby normal, right? Is that Definitely. correct? Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I just want to comment. Uh, I will. I will let you ask a question. For example, for brain tumors, usually we don't have much normal. They don't take extra pieces of the brain, <laughs> um, so we we tend to cluster and compare a tumor, a brain tumor type versus another. But that's another. That's another question. Yes. No, okay. Okay. Uh, someone else had a question. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a question about, uh, for example, uh, like what I wanted to know is, let's say you did your DNA sequencing and you found a uh, synonymous variant in the last amino acid uh, that's at the exon intron junction. And you wanted to see if the synonymous change actually resulted in exon skipping. And you did your, and you did your uh, RNA uh, seq or your mRNA uh, like sequencing. How would you visualize that in, like how would you know if that synonymous variant in that area is actually causing exon skipping or some sort of uh, event in the mRNA. So you would um, align your read uh, um, to your genome, and then you would uh, estimate the expression of different transcripts and see if uh, in the sample with or without mutation, you have a different transcript that's being expressed with or without the exon skip. Okay, so you would see it as a novel transcript in your IGV, or it would show up as. So if it's, uh, it depends if it's. Um, so we're actually going to talk about that. Uh, for example, with string tie, you can identify transcript expression and novel transcript expression. So you you would have you have investigate the output of string tag very carefully to see if you uh, can observe a difference between your sample with or without the mutation. And could you use IGV to visualize it, like to? After that, yes. After that, yes. Okay. Because you would see the read that map at the junction uh, before or after, uh, but it just it would be a visualization. It's not going to tell you. You would need some statistic uh, mm -hmm. and differential expression um, transcript analysis to really prove that there were a significant difference. Mm -hmm. um, but you could visualize it, yes, with uh, with IGV. Thank you. Um, okay, so here we're going to talk about how we estimate the expression of a known gene or a transcript, uh, what um, measure we usually use, uh, such as FPKM, or why would you use row counts as well, um, some of the differential expression methods, and then a, bit of, a little bit of the downstream analysis. Um, so here is an example, if you, load, if you load your BAM file from um, your tumor and you control um, in IGV and look at the particular genes, you can actually see at the top uh, the coverage and you could possibly think that this particular gene might be differently expressed because clearly uh, there is less coverage of expression at the bottom part in the, um, that at the top. But um, this has a lot of canvia. You cannot do that um, just by looking at JGV uh, because you might have not um, sequenced as deeply both of the samples. Um, and for example, uh, the, if you compare different uh, genes, your genes um, lengths could be different. So you wouldn't have the same number of read on a gene versus yours. So it's not the way we do it. It's the way you could go back and have a look, but it's not the way you detect differential expression. 
So one way that we do it is to have uh, is to first estimate or evaluate uh, the expression level using some measure. And one of them uh, initially was the uh, RPKM, the read per kilo base per transcript per million map read of transcript per million map read. And then when we had pair reads, we use now fragments FPKM, fragment per kilo base of transcript per million map read. Um, so the in the in your dataset that have the relative expression of the transcript is proportional to the number of the CDNA fragments um, where it comes from, but as well as as our PS towards the number of fragments um, uh, of the number of fragments towards larger gene. Of course, if you have a larger gene, you're more likely to get fragments from it. Um, and the total number of fragments that um, is related to your total library JS. So we need to correct for this. And one way to do it is to use the FPKM value for which you get the number of mappable read um, and you divide uh, by the total number of mappable read. Um, 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 sorry, uh, from the fragment library and the length of your gene or your transcript. Um, and another, um, um, I would say measure if I can say, call it, I guess I'm not sure what the best way to call that. Uh, value is the TPM. Basically, you want to correct for the same thing, the length of the transcripts and the number of read in your library, but you do it in the other way around. Um, for the TPM, you divide the fragment count by the length of the transcript, then you sum all the FPK, the uh, fragment per kilo base, and you divide by the library per million. Uh, and then you divide one by two, and you have a TPM. So basically, the TPM gives you the proportions of um, of the read uh, for a given gene or transcript in your library, and um, people like it because you can compare uh, more easily between uh, between samples because the total number of PPM is equal in the different um, samples, so it's easier to compare with the proportions. Um, so when you have your uh, <laughs> So you can use, um, sorry, you have your read data um, as your RNA read and you want to estimate the transcript uh, level expression. Um, for a gene, it's more easily to work with the XPKM because you have the annotated gene and you, um, you get the number of reads that map to the gene and you compute the XPKM. For a transcript, you need to define uh, what is actually, which transcript is expressed, I mean, which the combination of exons is the right one. And, uh, and do you, how much do you attribute to those read that map to exon one to transcript one or transcript two or transcript three that are all part of um, exon one being all part of the three transcript, but exon two being, for example, only part of uh, transcript uh, two. So um, there are different uh, um, tools that do that, that try to evaluate uh, the transcript expression. This is not an easy problem. Uh, one of the early one was scuffling. And then um, later string times came along and we'd had a, a more accurate uh, estimation of the transcript level. Um, so basically uh, string types look for paths of, um, of for which you can assign most of the read um, with a better pass uh, uh, going from exon to exon. And, and uh, go back to build a flow network of the paths of the AVS coverage and then update um, to have another pass with the remaining reads, et cetera, et cetera, to try to estimate uh, as accurately as possible um, all the expression of the different transcripts. You can as well discover a new transcript. Um, at the end, uh, you need to run a merge of the student types because you can have some gene structures that were identified in some sample and not in others. So you would have your transcript, uh, I don't know, 25 of, gene, of a given gene that is uh, being quantified in, in one sample, but actually is not present in your, um, in your output of the other, uh, the other samples. So you want to merge all those transcripts to have expression value of the, all the different transcripts identified across all samples. That's uh, why you wouldn't want to run string time merge. Um, so it's allowed to incorporate uh, non transcript with assemble and possibly to be novel transcript as well. There is a mode for a de novo or from guest mode, and then you need to rerun it. 
Um, you can use as well the two just compare to compare a match transcript GTF uh, to what uh, as compared to known annotation. So we already have annotation of gene and the given transcript, and you can compare the output of uh, the transcript you detect to what is known. Um, so one way to perform differential expression analysis um, following yes. string tie, yeah. Um. I don't know if it's a relevant question. It's just I, for transcript quantification, I've seen Callisto being used. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the difference with the tools that you just mentioned? I haven't used Callisto. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now what's the big difference, how one compared to the other. So if, Maybe if someone else easy. know? Yeah, okay. So. Yeah. Um, so I, I use Callisto for my for my RNA seq analysis. Um, the big difference between Callisto and the rest of the um, aligners that that we've talked about here is the the mathematical basis to it, um, which is well beyond my capacity to explain. Um, but I will post a link to the Pacta Labs uh, Callisto help page um, in the channel. Um, I do recommend it because it's computationally very efficient and straightforward to use. Um, and there's a follow-up suite for differential expression called Sleuth. Um, that's also great and I love. Um, but yeah, I will post you, I will post you the link and the paper so you can look at it because the maths is like way above my head. Um, yeah. So probably above mine too. Yeah, okay, that's what I heard, that it was really, really fast compared to cufflinks, let's say. So I was wondering what was the trick behind. Okay, thank you very much. I have a, a question for you, Emma, on Callisto. Does it, so I thought it does not produce an alignment, like a BAM. It just does a pseudo alignment on the fly and calculates, yes. calculates, calculates, and you get counts and that's it. So if you want yes. to do anything with the BAM afterwards... Callisto is not your tool, but it's your tool. You can to generate have... a BAM. Okay. And that takes longer though. Yeah, that definitely takes longer. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Callisto doesn't align in the same way that the tools yeah. that we're talking about. It does a pseudo alignment where it sort of, it yeah. aligns a certain proportion of the reads and then it mathematically estimates the likelihood that it belongs to that fragment as opposed to any other fragment. Um, and it's very complicated and I, I don't have a maths degree. Um, but yes. But yeah, yeah, uh, you can skip the alignment and do the different uh, transcript expression uh, evaluation and I just, yeah. Um, uh, yes, Paul Gunn has to, uh, to perform differential expression analysis. So it's one of the tools in the suite after string ties you can use Paul Gunn. Uh, we can briefly talk about all the pipeline you can use. Uh, there are other, other way to do that as well. Uh, Paul Gunn uh, uses a parametric FTS uh, comparing nested linear models. So we actually can compare two model fit uh, with a fetch feature using the expression as the outcome. So you want to estimate the best fit with your expression of your gene, considering or know the provide of interest being, for example, of a case or control, or if you have a time series, what time it was in comparison and function of uh, what you're comparing. Um, so the F statistic and the p-value calculates uh, using as a fit uh, sorry, of the two models. And then you get a p-value if the p-value is cynical environment, that means you actually <coughs> have a better fit when you take into account this feature being case or control, and that's a differential expression. Of course, you want to run multiple testing and you want to consider the q-value rather than the p-value, with a standard thing as being a q-value below 0, 0, 0.05. Um, um, yeah, and I think there is a slide about multiple testing so that's going to come after. Um, so this is um, one of the outputs, a, a visual output you can get, the plot you can get from one group. Um, then you can look at the LOF2 FPTM value of your different sample. You can generate a basic cost plot of a particular gene looking at the expression level from here it's a uh, male versus female, and you can look at the uh, expression of the different uh, transcript of a given gene. And this is a structure of the object uh, volume that you're going to play with in the lab. Um, alternative to FPKN, actually, a lot of us 
I would say, don't use as necessarily FPKM, but we base, prefer uh, to use a raw uh, read count based uh, analysis that you can use uh, with uh, DC or HR. Uh, um, so the raw read count is an alternative for differential expression analysis. Um, instead of calculating the FPKM, you actually simply assign the number of uh, fragments uh, to your genome to your, you know, your transcript. Uh, you can get this number with uh, SP, the HTC tool and the HTC count function, um, as well as if you run star, there is a count mode uh, option running when you run your star command to get right away the output of the uh, of um, of the count for a given gene. Um, and just as it was a side note that I wrote, uh, I guess, two years ago, because we had experience with that. And you need to pay attention to look at which column you need to use in the output of the of the star for the counts that it could be not the entity column I you think it would be. <laughs> uh, because then you need to, for example, the, uh, it's a fourth and not the third column. That's just something you, you would want to check when the first time you get the output of your star to make sure that you're taking the color that uh, makes sense. Um, so that's another way to get an estimate, uh, to get a count for your read, uh, read count for your gene after you line star, after you use star. Um, there are, um, so you can, you do different things. If you get FPKM expression, um, it's, uh, it would be used when you want to um, benefit of the tuxedo suite. So um, string time, book rune, and all the tools that are within the suite. Uh, it's good for visualization and heat map because you normalize by library size and by gene lens. Um, so you can more, I would say, quickly compare the expression level. You can compute full change. However, using the raw count allow you to use more robust statistical method for differential expression analysis. Um, and I come from also sophisticated experimental design that as you can do with uh, DSIC uh, and HR. Uh, so those are the two most, uh, the most popular way to perform the uh, tools to perform differential expression analysis. Um, DSIC2, uh, for, that's follow the DSIC. Um, that you can use a complex design matrix specifying, uh, of course, your case control, but more uh, information you get about your sample to uh, to better uh, perform your differential expression analysis with information with an informed design matrix. Um, within the SIG2, you can actually uh, run the variant stabilizing transformation, um, which you do that after size factor normalization, and you could use that for clustering uh, with the visualization. Uh, it's good as well for between sample comparison. Um, just a side note that after this normalization and VST transformation, uh, it hasn't been corrected for gene lens. So if you want uh, to compare sample uh, uh, like gene, uh, within a sample, the expression of a gene, you do want to correct for gene lens, so compute a type of FK, FPKM after. But you can compare gene A in sample A and B directly, but not gene A and B in the same samples if you haven't corrected for gene lens with those values. And uh, another link is for EJAS, uh, another very popular tool, which I believe uh, which uh, use the same statistical uh, method behind as the DC with some, uh, with some uh, particular uh, way to run the analysis, but they are two very good tools as well. Um, if you do run several methods um, and several ways to, uh, to get different flexible analysis, you will not get the exact same gene list at the end of being a significantly diff gene definitely diff expressed after uh, a Q value being below 0, 0, 005 um, for multiple reasons. If you want to be really conservative and propose um, a gene for maybe some validation, you might want to. <laughs> run several one and take uh, the overlap. Um, but uh, the one that's only called by HR, for example, or DSIC, uh, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily a, a false positive. Um, so there is no perfect method. Um, and uh, sometimes you just have to choose which one you, you go with. It's an of your question as well. Um, yeah, a few words about multiple testing, uh, testing correction. I believe you're aware of that, but it's important that you realize it's something we all have to, to do when you do um, this kind of test, when you compare the expression of every, of every single gene in the genome 
uh, when you transcript them. Um, if it's different expressed between condition A and B, you do uh, 20,000 tests, 25,000 tests. So you're more likely to have a test that is um, become that is significant and it shouldn't be than if you were doing one or two tests, for example. So you want to correct for this and what you do when you actually um, get the adjusted p-value called the, uh, the q-value um, with a multiplicity correction. So it's such a q-value in this two which is an output that comes directly with the p-value. So you always consider the q-value rather than the p-value in the output of your differential expression analysis because of multiple testing. Some, um, um, what can you do after? <laughs> you can do a lot of things. Um, it really depends on your, your questions. Uh, usually you pass on to, you do some, maybe some clustering, uh, heat map representation, um, you pass on to how, or do you do password analysis, um, you're going to do that in the module later on, it, uh, it really depends on your question. Um, um, I just added a few slides about, uh, you might be interested in actually using uh, already published data sets, uh, which are related to the tumor type you're interested in. Um, and you have access to a lot of data sets that are in GU. They are mainly array-based, but there are some marina especially for models. Um, so it's a question of if the um, sample, uh, the people that generate the sample were allowed to deposit uh, the data uh, in GU or not, because it's uh, open as it's not control access, it's open. Uh, most of the human aeronautic are under control uh, access, such as in EG, I mentioned above, but actually you can find some in NGO. Um, so it's a, um, it's a problem of uh, not being able to uh, personally identify um, the, where the sample comes from at the end, if you do have read from a particular tumor. Um, but still, if you look at mouse model or ganoid or something like that, a model of your tumor, you might, find a lot of uh, data set. The mutilation data are actually in GEO as well because they are all mainly ivory based for the 450k and 50k data. Um, the other place you might actually deposit your own samples uh, when you publish it or you want to have access to is uh, EGA uh, uh, managed by the European Bioinformatics Institute and the Center for Genomic uh, Regulation, the CRG in Barcelona. Um, so you need to actually request access to the data to the data access committee and there is a data access agreement that needs to be signed or allow you to uh, download um, the raw files of, um, of a particular um, data set. Um, so you can, this can take a bit of time, <laughs> but it's worth doing it because there are a lot of that, uh, cool data out there. It really depends again on your project and your question. Um, I wanted to point out that there, there are a lot of um, um, data out there of uh, cancer type, and especially one of the very large projects, as you're probably aware of, is the TCG, uh, TCGA, um, run by the NCI, and the, uh, so over 20,000 um, primary tumor and match normal have been um, uh, sequenced with different type of humic and the span 33 cancer type. Uh, you probably have seen the big papers that came out of the different cancer type. Um, and there is a portal uh, for which you can query process data um, quite uh, easily um, and retrieve. And I was actually curious to see what kind of pipelines they use for the data they share. And this is the NASIC uh, mRNA analysis pipeline um, that they use. Um, so actually they do use STAR uh, for the Class junction detection per salignment with star, with two passes. Um, they do get the BAM and then they use uh, HTC uh, count, um, and that's the type of gene expression. They provide uh, gene expression at the, uh, with a count from HTC, um, some FPKM, FPKM, UQ file use uh, with a type, some type of normalization. So they do run fusion as well, um, transcription analysis um, from Ariba and star fusion, so two different ways. Um, so that's uh, how they obtain the count uh, um, after the alignment with stars as information. And there's a type of data um, they actually uh, give uh, access to. Um, so the analytic alignment as a BAM file, the HTC read count, the star read count, 
the FPKM and FPKM UQ value. So you can start from one of those files and do your analysis. Um, I use a sample for your analysis as well. And the, all the documentation on the website. Um, so the thing is that here it's all at the gene level. You wouldn't have transcript information, which is might be something, something you want. And uh, one of the reasons you would use uh, string time. Um, and that's it for this lecture. Is there any 